Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us again today for our three-part series on Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, this is part two, and we are today going to be talking about who is Our Lady of Guadalupe to the Aztecs, or who was she to them. <clears throat> I'm just going to jump right in today, uh, since we already have our um, kind of base that we talked about last week, who was Our Lady of Guadalupe to the Spanish. Today, uh, I'm going to give a brief history of the Aztecs. Uh, I'm going to look at their history as well as their religious system. Uh, I'm going to go again <clears throat> over the story of Juan Diego and uh, what that meant to the Aztecs and also go over the image itself and what that meant to them. Okay, so <clears throat> The earliest known major civilization in Mesoamerica, which is just kind of that Central America region, uh, were the Olmecs. Now that's a that's an Aztec term or a Nahua term, <clears throat> and it means rubber people. <clears throat> we're not really sure why they were called the rubber people, but we do know that the um, there was a uh, a major sport that was played um, <clears throat> in the area. That used a rubber ball. It was quite brutal, actually, um, but it was common throughout the region for for a very long time, and it may be related to that, but we're not really sure. Um, <clears throat> so they dominated the region from about 1500 BC to about 350 BC. So a very long time. Um, during this period of time, the Zapotec Teotihuacan and Mayan civilizations also began to develop. Uh, the Olmecs went into decline <clears throat> and were replaced by the Epi-Olmecs. We call them the Epi-Olmecs because they came after the Olmecs, but we don't actually know what they were called. Uh, and they dominated the region from 300 BC to about 250 AD. Now one of the things that you'll find is that our information about <clears throat> these periods of time is very sparse so I'm giving a very 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 high level uh, kind of history because of that um, and the reason it's sparse is because they didn't have um, like a lot of written records like we do in the old world and so um, <clears throat> a lot of it is um, kind of oral history that we have from from the time of the Aztecs and uh, also archaeological uh, evidence that we have. From about 250 AD to about 800 AD, um, the, T the Mayan and Teotihuacan city-states civilizations dominated the region. So there were many different city-states. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they were all kind of independent. Um, but we kind of talk about them as being Mayan or Teotihuacan because of their association with these groups. Um, so, <clears throat> for example, when we talk about the Mayan civilization, it's the, the Mayan people, but the actual civilizations that grew up were mainly city-states that were independent from each other over time, and some came and went and that kind of thing. <clears throat> Same thing with Teotihuacan and the Zapotecs, Olmecs, Toltecs, etc. that we're going to be talking about. So in the early 9th century, uh, Teotihuacan went into decline and the city-state of Monte Alban rose to pro prominence. <clears throat> um, after that, the Toltecs, uh, they kind of came to dominate the region from about 950 AD to 1150 AD. The Aztecs really think, of, they really thought about the Toltecs as their cultural and intellectual predecessors. Um, <clears throat> then there was a period uh, between the Toltecs and the Aztecs that there wasn't really any one major civilization that was dominating and that was about for 150 years. And then um, the Aztecs, uh, they kind of came to prominence in Mesoamerica. Um, <clears throat> so the, the Aztecs, that term Aztec 
it really refers to a group of people who spoke the Nahuatl language. Um, and when we talk about the Aztec Empire, we're talking about different Nahua speaking tribes that came into alliance with each other and formed an empire. Uh, so the, the Aztecs, they were originally a nomadic people and <clears throat> they, when they came to, to, to dominate Mesoamerica, it's because they finally settled in the area and established cities. <clears throat> and so the Aztecs, they dominated the area from about 1300 um, to the time of their overthrow by Cortes in 1521. So <clears throat> they share common, common religious patrimony uh, with the surrounding cultures, such as the Teotihuacan, the Zapotecs, the Mayans, the Incas. Um, so for example, you'll find the feathered serpent god Quetzalcoatl, which was an Aztec god, um, also in other cultures. So for example, um, the Mayans, I believe, I believe it was the Mayans, he was Kukulkan, and then the Incas was Cucumats. Um, but they're all feathered serpent gods. And that's because this religious patrimony probably comes from an earlier period, uh, an earlier civilization that influenced the different uh, groups. Um, because they all kind of had influence on each other in terms of the religious systems and practices. <clears throat> so in 1325, the Mexica tribe, which was... Um, a Nahuatl speaking tribe, so one of the Aztec tribes, they founded the city-state Tenochtitlan, um, which is today Mexico City. Now, this is the Mexican flag today, and you can see on it uh, an eagle uh, standing on top of a cactus with a serpent in its mouth and it's being grasped by the foot. Now, the, uh, the Mexica, they had a prophecy that when they found the sign, which was the sign of an eagle standing on a cactus with a serpent in its mouth, um, that would be the sign for where they were supposed to establish um, their home, their homeland. And so that's why that's the symbol of uh, Mexico today. <clears throat> And actually, they did see that sign uh, when they came to um, Lake Texcoco, which is where Tenochtitlan was founded. And uh, that is this. So you can see Lake Texcoco. On the western side, you can see a little star there. That's Mexico Tenochtitlan. That is uh, where they founded their city. Um, and... Uh, that's where they are today. All right. <clears throat> so who were the Aztecs? What did they believe? So the Aztecs believed that the world was created by the blood of the gods. So they believed that um, the earth was created out of the blood of uh, the god Kepaktli. Uh, the moon was created by the blood of the goddess Koyoshauqui, and humans were believed to have been created out of the blood of Quetzalcoatl. So the idea there was that <clears throat> in one of the sun ages, uh, which I'll get to, um, the humans had been wiped out, they were all killed, uh, because the world was being destroyed. And Quetzalcoatl, who had a particular love for, for humanity, he went into the underworld and shed his blood, and his blood went onto the bones of all the dead humans, and it resurrected them, and it resurrected humanity. And so <clears throat> that's why the, Az the Aztecs believed um, at the time when uh, Cortes arrived, that Quetzalcoatl had created human uh, created humans because that was their their myth. <clears throat> so in 
So they believed that the world ran in sun cycles and that each, each cycle a new civilization was born um, and it would live during that sun cycle and then catastrophe would strike that civilization would die out and that was basically the end of the world <clears throat> and so when Cortez arrived um, they believed that they were in the fifth sun cycle um, and each sun cycle was uh, ruled or governed by a different sun god so <clears throat> the first sun god was Tezcatlipoca the second one was Quetzalcoatl, the third one was Tlaloc. Tlaloc was actually the rain god, and so that sun cycle was the, rains, the, the rain sun cycle. Um, after him was uh, Chalchulique, <clears throat> and then the last one, uh, the one where um, that they were in when Cortez arrived, was the fifth sun cycle ruled by Huitzilipochtli, who was the uh, the god of war and he was actually also the particular the special patron of the Mexica tribe and so that's part of the reason um, which I'll get to it's part of the reason that the Mexica tribe were very um, warlike it's because their god was a, a, a war god so they considered themselves to be a warrior tribe now <clears throat> A major religious practice uh, was the sacrifice of humans and bloodletting, which was basically to um, cut yourself and let yourself bleed um, for different purposes. So why were they doing blood sacrifice? The reason is multifold. Um, the kind of cosmological idea that they had was the um, the sun and the moon were in warfare <clears throat> and so as the sun rose in the morning and uh, throughout the day um, that's when it had gained power and prominence and then towards the latter part of the day it was in decline and the moon was winning the war and then as night came the moon came to dominance and it was winning the war and so because <clears throat> they associated different gods with um, with different elements of nature in the current sun cycle Quetzalcoatl being the sun god he was actually in war with the moon god Coyoshauqui who was his sister and also the Tsitsimime which were the sun uh, which were the stars and they were all the other gods basically um, <clears throat> and so because all of creation is created out of the blood of the gods it was believed that if they didn't offer human sacrifice um, and offer back to the gods blood because the gods had shed their blood to create everything um, it was believed that if they didn't return back blood to the gods that it would bring an end to the world because then the gods wouldn't have the blood that they needed to keep everything in existence <clears throat> And so, especially in this war between the sun and the moon, between Huitzilopochtli and Coyoshauqui, um, the Aztecs, uh, they were offering um, blood sacrifice to, to him to sustain him in his war against Coyoshauqui. Um, Tezcatlipoca, who was the first sun god, he was angry at creation, he was angry at humanity, and in order to placate his wrath, they would offer blood sacrifice to him. They offered blood sacrifice and bloodletting to Quetzalcoatl because they believed that, as I said, he created them, so it was done out of thanksgiving. And then they had a bunch of other reasons that they would offer blood sacrifice to all the other gods. <clears throat> and... Uh, so the fifth sun cycle was thought to be the uh, the cycle of earthquakes, the, the, the sun of earthquakes. And so they believed that if Quetzalcoatl lost the war against Coyoshauqui, that the world would be torn apart by earthquakes um, if she won the war. 
and that everything would come to an end. <clears throat> uh, so that's kind of the idea behind the ritual sacrifice and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I don't want to really get into uh, why they would do uh, cannibalism. Uh, they did have religious reasons for that, but I'm going to kind of skip over that today. Um, instead, I want to focus on a couple of other features of the religious system. Uh, the first being chromaticism. Uh, this is different from, like, if you study music and you learn about uh, chromaticism in music, that's a different concept than what we're talking about here. For the Aztecs, when we talk about chromaticism, we're talking about the use of color. Um, in their um, religious rites, in their dress, in their music and poetry, um, <clears throat> what they what they would do is they would use very vibrant colors in all of this, especially if it was iridescent, like shiny and shimmering and stuff, uh, because for for them <clears throat> the symbolic nature of the um, the, the, the plurality of color that you see, for example, in a rainbow, it signified um, uh, the supernatural. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to talk about um, is the uh, Aztec Codex system. So we know about the Aztec Codex system because it was um, recorded uh, by the Franciscans, I believe, uh, after the period of conquest. Um, so basically what we have today is we have manuscripts of symbols and what those symbols meant. And I think I have an example of that. <clears throat> Yes, here it is. Okay. So this is basically what it would have looked like, uh, a page from one of the codices. So you can see there's symbols, and then above each symbol you have a word or phrase. Basically, that's just describing what the symbol means. So the idea here is throughout Aztec art and architecture and, uh, and religious symbolism, you're, you'll see a lot of uh, symbols like you see on this page. What the Franciscans did was they recorded those symbols and what they meant for us so that we know um, we have a way of reading old Aztec um, art. <clears throat> this is important because uh, it's actually a whole language. Uh, it's like uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, for example, is the way that they, they wrote. Um, they wrote in symbols. And so the fact that we have a way of interpreting it is great. <clears throat> it's also important because, as we'll see with Our Lady of Guadalupe's image, the whole thing is Aztec Codex um, symbolism. And we'll get to that. Okay. By the way, I did want to show some uh, examples of uh, things that they would have used in their chromatic um, style. So you can see, like, beetle shells can be very colorful. Uh, same with butterfly wings and feathers. All of that would have had um, supernatural significance to the Aztecs. Um, and they used all of this in their, as I say, their dress and their poetry and all of this um, as a way of expressing supernatural ideas. Okay. Now, there was a parallel tradition among the Aztecs, and not just among the Aztecs, but among the other cultures, uh, like the Maya and... Um, some of the other uh, groups, some of the other tribes that are from southern United, United States. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, flower world, poetry, and, and symbolism. Um, we know about them because we have some of the poetry today, 
and we also know that it's an ancient form because uh, we see flower world depictions on ancient cave paintings so it's a very very old tradition and it's likely a distinct tradition from um, the 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 other system of, of blood sacrifice and and all the the pantheon of gods that they have um, <clears throat> but because there's so much intermingling of, of different uh, religious ideas between the tribes that these two systems kind of came together um, and so you we see this um, flower world poetry um, present <clears throat> along with the um, the the rest of the the religious system of the Aztecs and so these um, flower world poems they would have been recited at major religious ceremonies um, and that's actually how they were transmitted it was all orally um, but after the Franciscans came um, they started recording things for posterity uh, they wrote these down as well <clears throat> so some of the key features of the poetry was that flowers signify truth um, flower world was only open uh, to certain classes of people so it would have been nobles uh, warriors who died in um, combat and women who died in childbirth and so they could go to the flower world which was basically a world of um, it was a paradise it was a paradise of pleasure and and beauty beauty and peace and truth and um, and so only <clears throat> only nobles could be adorned with flowers um, flower world can't be found here in this world uh, on earth um, <clears throat> and also the reason that m most men and women can't go there is because of human weakness and sin um, there is a there's a little bit of controversy some say that there's a unique god in flower world poetry uh, in Tlokwe and Nahuakwe translated as the cause of all um, others say that that's actually an epithet of one of the other Aztec gods um, if it is a different religious tradition it's likely that it was perhaps originally a different god a unique god um, that kind of when the two traditions came together um, they kind of merged um, and it's possible that it did become in time an epithet of one of the other gods from the other religious tradition um, so much of <clears throat> the, the period before um, Cortez is just not known um, just because we don't have records uh, at least not clear records anyway okay so in the in the years preceding the Spanish uh, conquest um, some important things happened <clears throat> so in 1428 the Mexica who are the ones who founded Tenochtitlan uh, they formed a triple alliance uh, between the city-states um, Tenochtitlan uh, also Texcoco and Tlacopan and this alliance created the Aztec Empire which at its height is what you see on the screen right now um, that's the land that it covered at the time um, between 1450 and 1454 the Mexican Basin suffered a severe drought this did two things um, it instigated the flower war wars which were a, a regular um, annual series of, of wars fought between members of the Triple Alliance um, that they were planned ahead of time everybody knew it was going to happen um, the idea was that <clears throat> in this war you not only gained excellence in um, in warfare so you, you practiced your skills but you also were able to take um, prisoners 
for the purpose of blood sacrifice, um, which again goes to help the the god, the sun god Huitzilopochtli, in his war against um, Koyo Shaukwi. Uh, <clears throat> another thing happened, which was um, they increased the blood sacrifices um, that they were doing. It's believed that before this time, um, although there were blood sacrifices being done, it wasn't done to the same extent. It was a lot less, but they believed that the drought was caused by a lack of blood being offered to the gods. And so they increased the number of blood sacrifices um, after this period. That's probably also one of the reasons that the flower wars were instigated was to gain more people for the purpose of increasing their blood sacrifices. Um, the warriors would have participated in this happily um, because, as I mentioned before, if you died in battle as a warrior, you got to go to Flower World, uh, whereas most people didn't get that opportunity. Uh, so it's not as if this was something that was being foisted on the men of these tribes. They actually um, were quite, quite okay with doing it. <clears throat> okay, so in 1502, Montezuma II came to power, and he was the ruler um, of the empire when Cortes arrived. He expanded the empire um, further than what it had been. Uh, he ruled as an absolute monarch, uh, and he further separated the divide between the nobility and the common classes <clears throat> but because he ruled with an iron fist he was forced to quell several insurrections because people don't like that um, especially along the fringes of the empire in 1509 uh, there were a series of omens that started in 1509. There were eight omens. These omens uh, were understood by the Aztecs to be warnings that the that the Aztec civilization and maybe even the end of the world were imminent. The, the end of the Aztec civilization was imminent. Uh, that's especially how Montezuma II took it because he being the ruler was afraid of his empire uh, being taken away. And so <clears throat> the first omen was a comet. Um, and these happened over several years. These weren't all at, at once, um, but they were all understood the same way. So the other ones were the temples of Huitzilopochtli and Xutecutli caught fire. Uh, a triple meteor was seen. There was a mini tidal wave from Lake Tishkoko, which caused flooding. There was the sound of a weeping woman that was heard throughout Tenochtitlan for several nights, although its source couldn't be found. Um, on another occasion, there was a strange bird that was found in the area, and it had a, a its head was like shiny, like an orb. And when Montezuma saw it, he had a vision in it um, that showed the coming of the Spanish. We know that's what it was because the description of it was white men with, with, with armor um, who were riding uh, large deer is how they described it because horses are not native to North or South America. So they'd never seen deer before, uh, horses before. So they described them as deer. So he actually had a vision of the Spanish coming and that happened only, uh, well, that happened, sorry, a, a while before, but only weeks before the arrival of the Spanish, there appeared a two-headed man in Tenochtitlan, and when they brought him to Montezuma, he vanished, just disappeared. So there were several omens that were, that preceded the coming of the Spanish that put all the Aztec on edge because they thought their empire was coming to an end and possibly the end of the world, maybe the end of the Sun Age. <clears throat> so you can imagine that when the Spanish did arrive, it was quite uh, 
quite disconcerting for everybody. All right. <clears throat> so when we get to the story of Guadalupe, its event, there's two aspects of it that we can consider that I think should be considered. There's the story of Juan Diego, which I gave a synopsis of last time. Uh, and then there's the image itself, <clears throat> which you can see on the screen, of course. Um, there's a recent theory that's being put forward by Joseph and Monique Gonzalez. They've appeared on Tim Gordon's channel, Rules for Retrogrades, twice now, um, talking about this, um, which suggests that the Nika and Moboa is part two of the first Flower World poem. So the first Flower World poem is called Song at the Beginning, and it's really what lays the groundwork um, for the whole idea of what, what Flower World is, why we can't go back there, and <clears throat> and they think that the Nikon Mapoa, the way it was written, is actually uh, the second chapter in that story. Um, it's a really great um, theory. I think it's correct, and I think if you want to learn more about it, you can certainly watch uh, those two episodes. Um, they are writing a book. Last time they appeared on the channel, they said that uh, they were at 800 pages. That's what they're expecting it to be. So it'll be quite a quite a large volume, and I would certainly look out for that um, because I think it'll be great <clears throat> if you really want to get a really deep dive into Guadalupe. Okay, so <clears throat> that's their thesis. Um, the there are certain similarities between the two that are important. So for example, in the flower world poetry, the poet gathers flowers in his tilma. So does Juan Diego. Um, the songs talk about, they make reference to the coil in the, the Tsnitskin birds. So does uh, the, um, the Nikon Mopoa. The rocks echoing the songs of the birds, the fragrant dewy flowers of great variety, all of it consistent with the chromatic nature of the poetry, all present in the Nikon Mapoa. In fact, the Nikon Mapoa, it's the language is all very similar in its chromatic uh, character as these flower world poetry uh, songs. So they see that Nikon Mapoa as a fulfillment of the wish of the poet to fi find flower world again. <clears throat> However, the way that it's fulfilled is through the Christian God, uh, who's brought to them by the Spanish, and actually what Juan Diego's story tells them, because Juan Diego was just a, a farmer, he was just a commoner, he wasn't a noble, um, but he was, a, in the story, in the Nican Mapoa, he finds himself in, in what he believes to be flower world, <clears throat> because he says, uh, when he hears the birds and he sees you know, the, the dewy uh, flowers and they're shining and, and all of this stuff. He says, am I worthy to hear this? When he hears, is this the land that my ancestors spoke of? So he is drawing the connection um, with what's happening to him when Our Lady appears to him um, with the flower world poetry. <clears throat> and so he being a commoner is now finding himself in flower world <clears throat> he's able to do that and it's because he's a Christian that's the idea so um, I'm gonna go through a series of um, comparisons of the texts just so that you can get an idea of what we're talking about here so this is from the song at the beginning the flower world poetry quote I am wandering where I may gather sorry I already messed it up I am wondering where I may gather some pretty, sweet flowers. Whom shall I ask? Suppose I ask the brilliant hummingbird, the emerald trembler. They will tell me whether I, where, whether I may gather them here in the laurel woods, where dwell the Tsinitskin birds, or in the flowery forest. Thus as I walk along I hear the rocks as it were replying to the sweet songs of the flowers. 
Perhaps the coil bird answers. And then this is from the Nican Mopoa. Juan Diego heard singing on the little hill like the song of many precious birds. When their voices would stop, it was as if the hill were answering them. Extremely soft and delightful, their songs exceeded the songs of the Coyototl and the Tsinitskin and other precious birds. A song at the beginning, quote, They led me within a valley to a fertile spot, a flowery spot, where the dew spread out in glittering splendor, where I saw various lovely fragrant flowers, lovely odorous flowers, clothed with the dew, scattered around in rainbow glory. And then from the Nikan Mopoa. Her radiance was like precious stones. It seemed like an exquisite bracelet. The earth seemed to shine with the brilliance of a rainbow in the mist. He was astonished by all of them, blooming open flowers of every kind, lovely and beautiful, when it still was not their season. They were giving off an extremely soft fragrance, like precious pearls, as if filled with the dew of the night. And then, of course, from the song of the beginning, So I gathered in the folds of my garment the various fragrant flowers. And from the Nikan Mapoa, Then he began to cut them, he gathered them all, he put them in the hollow of his tilma. <clears throat> the next... Um, I'm quoting so that you can see it's interesting because in the song at the beginning they reference as I said um, this God whose name is Intlokwe Inahuakwe which is translated as the cause of all it's translated differently in the Nikan Mapoa like when we translate it into English we translate it differently um, but it's the same Nahua word Intlokwe Inahuakwe so I'll just read these. So I, the singer, gathered all the flowers to place them upon the nobles, to clothe them and put them in their hands. And soon I lifted my voice in a worthy song, glorifying the nobles before the face of the cause of all, where there is no servitude. Where shall one pluck them? Where gather the sweet flowers? And how shall I attain that flowerly land, that fertile land, where there is no servitude nor affliction? If one purchases it here on earth, it is only through submission to the cause of all. Here on earth, grief fills my soul, as I recall where I, the singer, saw the flowery spot. <clears throat> so, cause of all, that's how it's translated in the Flower World Poetry texts. That's in Tlokwe in Ahuakwe. <clears throat> and from the Nikon Mopoa. And she said to him, no, be sure, my dearest and youngest son, that I am the perfect, ever-Virgin Holy Mary, mother of the one great God of truth, who gives us life, the inventor and creator of people, the owner and lord of what is around us and what is touching us or very close to us, the owner and lord of the sky, the owner of the earth. So that phrase, the owner and lord of what is around us and what is touching us or very close to us, that is in Tlokwe Nahuakwe. And so she's saying, Mary in this text, she's saying, I am the mother of in Tlokwe Nahuakwe, the cause of all, which is the god that's referenced in the flower world poetry. <clears throat> all right. So, the story of Juan Diego was essentially the gospel, I think, uh, that was preached to the Aztecs. So, when this story of Juan Diego was told to the Aztecs, uh, that's what actually brought them to Tenochtitlan to convert. Because many came from miles around. Um, they didn't see the image and then convert. They heard a story and they came. And the story was, through the Christian God, they, the Aztecs, whether commoner or not, would have access to the flower world. The afterlife of pleasure and peace and beauty and truth, which was previously only available to those three classes that I mentioned before. <clears throat> and so that was the evangelical work that was done in this event, was actually the story of Juan Diego. 
not the image. The image, on the other hand, after they had been convinced by the story, the image was a catechesis. Different. It's not evan the, the image wasn't evangelical. The story was. The image is catechetical. So let's talk about the image. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing to say, which I've already said, is that every element of the image is consistent with the Aztec uh, codex system, both in style and in content. Uh, this meant that the Aztecs could read it and know what it meant without anybody having to, to explain it to them. They could just look at it and they could read it as, um, <clears throat> as a story because they were already familiar with doing it. That's, that's their language. That's how they communicated um, with, uh, by, by, written, by written word, basically. <clears throat> this is astonishing, actually, because although it's true to say that it's consistent with their system, it's also true to say that it's consistent with the, um, the European uh, iconography systems of iconography, which were also catechetical in nature. <clears throat> okay. So, the second thing to say is that the Aztecs would have immediately understood this to be pertaining to something supernatural. And the reason for that is because of the chromatic nature of the image. Again, consistent with their own religious system. So, the it was iridescent, for example, the gold on the on her late uh, the lace gold um, and her hem which is also gold and the stars they all shine right uh, they're shiny and so it's iridescent in that sense right the other things are that um, depending on how the light hits it this is the same it's a, it's a similar feature that we find in in nature like in bird feathers uh, butterfly wings, um, beetle shells, similar to what I showed you earlier. Um, depending on how the light hits it, it'll look a different color, right? So <clears throat> the her veil, depending on how the light hits it, it's either turquoise or jade. So much bluer or really green. <clears throat> Mary's complexion also changes. Um, it, it can sometimes appear fairer like the Spanish, or darker, like the, the Aztecs. <clears throat> and, of course, the, the dress also can appear lighter or darker red, depending on how the light is hitting it. Okay, so the chromatic nature of the image tells them that this is a supernatural image we're looking at. Okay, so what about the woman? What did, what did they know about the woman? Well, <clears throat> they knew that in the Nican Mopoa, or the story of Juan Diego, Mary identified herself as the mother of the one great God of truth. Remember, in the flower world poetry, the flowers signify truth. So, truth is very, was very important to the Aztecs. Actually, <clears throat> um, what we know now is that the Aztecs... Um, they were, at the time, they were on the rise, philosophically speaking. Um, they were developing very complex ideas about truth and reality and um, the nature of, of good and evil and all of those kinds of questions. And truth was very, very important to them. And so when she says, I am the one great God of truth, <clears throat> that's meaningful. Um, it's, it's what they're striving for. Uh, she, she identified herself as the mother of Intlokwe Nahuakwe, the cause of all things. <clears throat> and that, yeah, okay. And so that's how she identified herself in the story of Juan Diego. And it's actually confirmed in the image. So the four-petaled flower, there's one on her dress. Um, this is the divine flower. It signifies divine life, and you can see on the image, in this, in this particular image, you can see it's very green, that's the jade, whereas the one on the left there is more turquoise. Um, 
this flower in the middle just below the sash that's the four petal flower it signifies divine life and so what we're seeing here then is mary um, pregnant with divine life it's also confirmed by the sash so the sash um, it's got the four um, hoops hanging down again the four signifies divine life um, it's also tied in the way that a pregnant woman would tie a sash um, there's other pieces of artwork that that show that and it's bl the, the the interesting thing about it being black signifies so black uh, signifies death and destiny or fate so the idea here is that she's pregnant with divine life and the fate of that divine life is to die which is actually what is taught to them by the Christians about Jesus that he came he was incarnated into this woman into Mary in order to sacrifice himself for us on the cross in order to save us <clears throat> Okay, so they knew that she, by this image, they know that she's pregnant with divine life, um, and that that divine life in her womb is destined to die. They know that she's not a god herself, because or a goddess, because her eyes are downcast, which means, um, well, first of all, Anytime they depicted a god or a goddess, the god was always looking straight at, uh, straight forward at the, the viewer. Um, never, never downcast or to the side or anything. And so the fact that she's not looking straight forward means she's not a goddess. That they're downcast means she's submissive, <clears throat> her hands folded, and the fact that she's dancing, that's what her, her knee being forward signifies. Those are prayer forms that would have been familiar to the Aztecs. And the veil not touching her skin, uh, the veil representing the heavens and also the afterlife, like the, 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 um, the abodes of the gods. Um, not touching her skin means it's not from her nature, right? And so uh, the heavens being placed on, on her is exactly what's being uh, signified there. <clears throat> okay, so they, they understood just by looking at this that she's not a goddess. Yet, she's standing in front of the sun, which to them, the sun signifies the sun god, Huitzilopochtli. She's standing in front of it signifies that she's greater than it. So she, not being a goddess, is more powerful than their most powerful god, Huitzilopochtli. Second, She's standing on the moon, and we know the moon signified Koil Shaukwi, the moon goddess. She's more powerful than the moon goddess. And the stars, the Tsitsimime, the, all the other gods, she's wearing like clothing. And so they understand from this image, she's not a goddess, but she's more powerful than all their gods. That's really, really cool, actually, I think. <clears throat> they know she's a princess first of all she's got the gold lace on her cuffs that's something royalty would wear but also when her veil is seen as turquoise um, that signifies in Aztec tradition um, when a new king was being inaugurated, he would wear a full turquoise cloak. And so she, and it was actually bejeweled. And actually, so when you look at this, if that's a turquoise cloak, bejeweled with the stars, then she's actually being inaugurated as the Aztec queen. The other thing, the last thing I want to point out to in terms of her identity is that the veil, although it's sometimes turquoise, at other times it's jade. The interesting thing about jade is in Aztec culture, it was jade was buried with the dead, especially with the nobles who could afford it. And that was to help facilitate 
their transition into the afterlife. Um, so if it's the nobility who can afford this, then the idea then is there being the jade is helping transition them into the afterlife of the flower world. And so she wearing a jade veil signifies that she, she can help facilitate um, our passage into paradise, which is what we believe as Catholics, that she intercedes for us, that we have the graces um, to achieve salvation and go to heaven. All right. <clears throat> so the angel at the base would not have been understood as an angel by the Aztecs. That they would have believed was, and they did believe, was Juan Diego. So they think that what, what he would be doing here is acting in the role of priest. So he's wearing multicolored feathers, which is how priests would dress. In fact, they would actually have the feathers attached to their arms and they would flap them like like an eagle and that's how he's seen depicted here with the feathers attached to his arms <clears throat> so he's seen uh, he's he's wearing the dress uh, the feathers of a priest the dress being red signifies earth and the reason for that is because um, they had um, in the area they had um, soil deposits that were deep red in color and also them believing that the world was created out of the blood of the gods um, red was associated with the earth so her dress being red is associated with earth and then he's holding in so he's holding the dress in one hand and in the other hand he's holding the veil and here the veil signifies two things it signifies the sky because it's filled with the stars but the Aztecs didn't necessarily associate the sky with the heavens of the afterlife. And so, uh, but what, how it does, how it is associated with the afterlife, so the, the heavens of the dead, so to speak, is because of its color as jade. And so, <clears throat> so he is uniting both heavens, the heavens and the earth, um, by holding each one, which is precisely what a priest does. He acts as an intermediary between um, the supernatural and the natural, heaven and earth. Um, <clears throat> okay. Juan Diego's name in Nahuatl, so Juan Diego was the name that he took when he became a Christian. It's his Christian name, um, which is John St. James, in case you didn't know. <clears throat> His name in Nahuatl was, um, uh, it was, um, Quadlatuatzin. Very difficult to pronounce, sorry. Um, and it means he who speaks like an eagle. Well, the eagle, um, signified the sun god. The eagle was the sun god. Uh, and so, he who speaks like an eagle, he's, he speaks, he's speaking the words of the gods, right? And that's also what a priest does. He speaks, he speaks on behalf of the gods. <clears throat> so his name was priestly. He wore the garments of a priest. He is seen holding heaven and earth, being a bridge between the two. And so what this told the Aztecs was that they, the Aztecs, by becoming Christians, wouldn't just be like second-class citizens within Christianity. They would get to share in even the highest parts of the the kingdom of God, which was which is the hierarchy, the the the, the priesthood, the the bishop, the bishopric. So they they were being promised something in this that as Christians they weren't relegated to just be commoners they could be they could be if they wanted um, as high as the priesthood as high as can be in in the in the hierarchy <clears throat> now the end of the world signified the end of a Sun Age which is I've mentioned that before 
and that corresponded with the end of a civilization. Montezuma fearing the eight omens, that they signified the end of the world, uh, and that they meant the end of his empire, um, was worried about that. And so were all the other Aztecs. With the beginning of a new sun age, a new sun god would rise to power. A new civilization would begin. If the story of Juan Diego and the Tilma um, confirm the coming of Intloque Nahuacue, the Aztecs might have interpreted that to mean that he was to become the new sun god. And if Intloque Nahuacue is the cause of all, and Mary says that she's pregnant with Intloque Nahuacue, and that this is actually God, the true God, then he would be now the new sun god for all time, because there is no greater god than the cause of all, that there's no other god who could supplant him. He's too powerful. And so, if that's true, if that's how they understood it, then they would have understood that this new civilization was going to be ruled and governed by Intelokwe and Ahuakwe forever. <clears throat> and so, there was going to be, with a new sun age, a new kingdom, a new civilization. And we would say that that is the church. So, would they have seen that in the image? I think they would have. So, with the dress, <clears throat> we have, as I said, we had the four-petaled flower, which signified divine life in her womb, but there are also two other kinds of flowers. There's the eight-petaled flower. The eight-petaled flower signified for the Aztecs um, the heavens, the gods, uh, the heavenly realms. Um, there was also the tepetal flower. <clears throat> the tepetal flower, um, it, the reason it's called tepetal is because in Aztec the word tep means mountain. And in their codex system, the glyph uh, for mountain was the tepetal flower. So I have that here. So here is the tepetal glyph. <clears throat> and so this glyph is found um, nine times on the dress. It's the tepetal flower. Uh, this one. So you can see that here. Okay, this flower appears nine times. The river glyph, which looks like this, there's lots of variations of this in their codex, but this is basically what it looks like. The river glyph is actually the stem of the tepetal flower on the dress. So what's actually being depicted on the dress nine times is a mountain with a river next to it. Which is really interesting because in the Aztec Codex system, when a mountain and a river are depicted together, they signify a city. And so there's nine cities being depicted on this dress. I don't know if the nine signifies anything in particular, but what we can say at least is that there is a kingdom or an empire here that's being depicted because you have many cities. And that's interesting because <clears throat> what we know about the dress, like I said, is that it has the, the flower of divine life, the flower of the heavens, and then this third flower, which signifies a city. And so what, you are, what you're seeing on the dress then is a kingdom or an empire that is both heavenly and it also has as a, at the center of it divine life, which is precisely what we talk about when we talk about the church. It's a kingdom that is a heavenly kingdom located here on earth that has as its center divine life, the divine life of God. And so I believe that's what's being depicted on the dress. <clears throat> and so, and so 
the image is a catechism. And this is what I think it's teaching. The Aztec civilization was over, but in its place a new one was being inaugurated. A heavenly king kingdom established here on earth, ruled by a queen more powerful than all of their old gods, but a human woman like them and mother to the divine creator, the cause of all, the one God of truth who had already established his kingdom among the Spanish, who was at the center of their kingdom, the church, who with 300 men had overthrown their empire of warriors and who now wished to establish this kingdom among the Aztecs who would not be mere commoners in this kingdom but who would share even in the highest positions of prestige as priests and nobles and by which they would all have access to the flower world, the paradise of pleasure, the perfect true afterlife of peace, beauty and happiness. I think that is what's being depicted here. So, who was Our Lady of Guadalupe to the Aztecs? Well, she was a healer for one. She healed Juan Bernardino. She's their queen. She's a princess. She's greater than their sun god, their moon gods, all their gods and goddesses. She's the mother of their great god in Tolokwe Nahuacue and also their mother. She belongs to the Christians yet she appears as one of them. She is mother to the Christians and is inviting them to become her children. In her is the promise of an end to human sacrifice because her son dies once for all and she is the gateway to the flower world. For the common man. And that's the end of this presentation. Thank you for being with me. Let's please close in prayer to Our Lady. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ave Maria gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, Nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.